Good evening. 2012 has passed very quickly. I wish to thank all of you for watching. But more importantly, I wish to thank you for listening and making those small changes that add up to a much healthier and happier life. Please keep your emails coming as I love hearing from each and every one of you. Make this year best year ever, one small change at a time, because time waits for no one. Here we have Joe, who recently had an abnormal stress test, and for that reason we decided to do a heart catheterization. When we are looking about the indication of the heart catheterization, there is many, chest pain, heart attack, but also on elective basis when the patient having some symptoms like trouble breathing, abnormal EKG, and they had an, a stress test which is subsequently lead to abnormal finding leading to the heart catheterization. So Joe here, when he comes in basically, the staff start working on him, interview him. They have all of the information about his name, his age, his family history, his previous medical history, decide about his allergies, his medications, and also be sure that he is ready and aware and full information about the risk and benefit of the procedure was given to Joe. The heart's main function is to pump blood to the rest of the body. To do this, it needs oxygen and nutrition for energy, just like other muscles. So it's important that the coronary arteries that bring blood to the heart muscle are not blocked. If you look into the arteries right now and try to understand the blockages build up, and we always talk and educate you about the necessity of diet and exercise. So try to understand how is the blockages build up. As you can see on the screen, the arteries are wide open and the blood uh, is running very smoothly. There is some yellow uh, uh, particles which is the bad cholesterol and the red one are the platelet and red blood cells and there is also a smaller uh, brownish uh, particle which is really the good cholesterol. There's always a competition between the good and the bad cholesterol leading to the uh, future management of the heart disease. We want the bad cholesterol to be as low as possible and we want the good cholesterol as high as possible. Why? Because the bad cholesterol, as you can see on the screen, it starts showing the buildup of the plaque, which is going to lead to a significant blockages. As you can see, the cholesterol LDL, the bad particles, start going inside the wall of the artery, and that will be the problem on the long run. Over the years, if you are a smoker, diabetic, high cholesterol, obese, all of that, you have a gene problem and your family, strong family history of coronary disease, you build up the plaque, and then you start having the platelet accumulating on top of that and building up a significant clot could lead to a massive heart attack as you can see on the screen the clot growing and growing and the plaque is building up more and more and then that's when you have the heart attack. A cardiac catheterization or heart cath is a diagnostic procedure that provides a picture of the blood vessels of the heart by using x-ray dye and fluoroscopy, a type of x-ray movie. These blood vessels called coronary arteries supply the heart with oxygen and nutrition. Coronary artery disease, heart valve disease, heart failure, and congenital heart disease are some of the problems that can be diagnosed with a cardiac catheterization. To start the heart catheterization, a numbing medication will be given before the catheter is inserted in the groin area or in your arm area, depending on which procedure we are using. The catheter will be guided to the heart. Once it's in place, dye will be injected into the coronary arteries. Your doctor can see any blockage as the dye moves through these, these arteries. A series of x-ray images will be made using a circular x-ray tube and rotate around your body. The doctor will view these images on a TV-like monitor in front of him. Some people fear a flushing sensation during the procedure, metallic taste, headache. All of these could be a side effect of the dye injected in your heart. Now let me show you how is that done. As you can see on the monitor here, the heart catheterization is started with the sheath and then the catheter introduced into that sheath, pushed into the femoral artery going into the aorta and then after that we reach to the heart as you can see it in a second 
where we engaging with the main arteries of the heart and we start injecting the dye to identify the blockages in those arteries. As you can see on the screen, after we inject the dye in the arteries of the heart, we identify the blockages as you can see it. That blockage is a significant one, leading to abnormal stress tests, leading to the angina symptoms or chest pain, trouble breathing, all of those symptoms which is, could happen in coronary artery disease. During the heart catheterization, if we decide to treat this problem, usually we start by doing what we call a balloon angioplasty. As you can see in that animation, it's showing that the, art, the, the balloon put in the blocked area, and then after that, we go through the wire, the same wire we, ad we advance the, the balloon, we go ahead and we put the stent, as you can see it in the screen. So the three steps of the management is to identify the blockage, treat it with the balloon first, and then after that with the stent, using a specific anticoagulation to make your blood thin enough during the procedure to have a better outcome on the long run. Joe finished his procedure, had his heart catheterization, and we're going to ask him a few questions because, as we mentioned earlier, we want that fear about the heart catheterization to go away from the people. So Joe is just an example, and it's a real patient who is going to tell you his experience about how did the procedure go. Hi, Joe. Hi. So you had your heart cath. Yes, I did. I'm going to let you speak and tell us exactly how was it and how everything went. Okay. I came into the cath lab, and there was four or five ladies that asked me a whole bunch of questions, slid me over on the, the bed, and the one lady told me, I'm going to give you something to relax you, and uh, which it did. It relaxed me. And uh, as I was laying there, uh, I uh, was uh, getting relaxed, and then you came in and did the heart cath. And uh, then after you did the heart cath, I laid there for a few more minutes, and they, they unhooked me, and they took me out, and it probably lasted a half hour or less. After we are done, did we do any, I mean, we, did we put a sandbag on your groin, and we told you you're going to stay uh, no, lying down? No, you, you put a plug in my groin. And then I went out to recovery, and they gave me some uh, meds, and then I went back up to my room. So within one hour, you are done. Yeah. You yeah. are able to walk, and you're feeling good, no problem, no bleeding. No mm -hmm. I hope after all of this information we provided you, we took the fear out of your mind about the heart catheterization. As we explained, it's a simple procedure. It doesn't take that much. At the same time, your doctor usually confident to explain everything to you how it's done from A to Z. You need to think about the heart catheterization is becoming a standard test to improve the outcome of patients, especially if it's needed. But the most important thing is the patient himself. You need to remember, if you start having symptoms, if you're having a chest pain, if you're having trouble breathing, shoulder pain, jaw pain, you need to talk to your family doctor who will be the captain to decide where to go from there. He should do the EKGs. He will order some testing for you, including stress test and echocardiogram and all of the tests which is, could help to decide about the future management for you. The bottom line, if your doctor tell you that you need a heart catheterization, don't be afraid. It's a simple procedure. All of the facilities which does this in our area are very equipped, very trained, and they are ready to do this procedure in a very easy way. I hope we took that fear out of your mind. Do you smoke or know someone who does? Then this program is meant for you. You will have a better understanding of what smoking does to your health. If you want to educate your kids about smoking, gather them around and watch this program together to talk about addiction, and the dangers of smoking. Cigarette smoking will cause nearly a half a million American deaths this year. And it's the number one preventable cause of death in the United States. Time Waste for No One mission is to educate you about not only how to treat medical problems, but how to prevent it. Today, we will answer the question for you, why you should quit smoking. And in the next episode, we will answer the question how to treat lung problems from smoking. Let's start. Most people who smoke wish they did not. They live with a hatred for the habit they cannot seem to do without. They live with fear of serious illness. 
and always have that awful feeling of being powerless to quit. Smokers live with the denial about what cigarettes are doing to them. Otherwise, there would be no comfort in smoking, no relief, and no pleasure. Let's learn how cigarette smoking and nicotine work on our body. No expression, hide my head, I want to drown my sorrow. No tomorrow, no tomorrow. And I find it kind of funny, I find it kind of sad. The dreams in which I'm dying are the best I've ever had. I find it hard to tell you, I find it hard to take. When people run in circles, it's a very, very mad. After this sad story, let's look into the fact of smoking and try to understand it so we will not be in the same position of Brian Curtis or his son. We know smoking kills and that we are playing roulette with our health. However, we also know that most smoking-related disease takes years to develop. So we tell ourselves we have time and nothing will happen to us. You are wrong, my friend. Five million people dying on the planet every year from tobacco use. And you need to realize that your chance as a smoker to get sick is increasingly and reasonably high. Smokers have a significant increase in their risk for health problems. Every cigarette is doing new damage. Lungs are like sponges with millions of tiny air sacs for transferring oxygen. Every breath of tobacco smoke attacks them. No wonder smokers feel short of breath. Their lungs are rotten. This is a healthy lung. And this is the amount of tar a pack a day smoker breathes in every year. Every cigarette is doing you damage. Smoking causes oral cancer. If it didn't, I wouldn't be needing chemotherapy. If looking at mouth cancer on your cigarettes makes you uncomfortable, look at another part of the pack. Quitting is hard. Not quitting is harder. They saw it throat cancer. They've come in and removed my voice box before they did this. They found out I got lung cancer as well. And the future plans right now are. Alexander, my oldest, is coming over here for a holiday December 13th. I will be alive for that. Every cigarette is doing you damage. Every time you inhale, tobacco smoke condenses in your lungs to form tar. This is a healthy lung. And this is the amount of tar a pack-a-day smoker breathes in every year. Smoking creates blood clots which can cause strokes. Some strokes kill, blind or paralyze. Others you don't even know you're having. This is the result of a minor stroke in a smoker, aged 38. Lungs are like sponges with millions of tiny air sacs for transferring oxygen. Every breath of tobacco smoke attacks them. No wonder smokers feel short of breath. Their lungs are rotting. This is part of an aorta, the main artery from the heart. Smoking makes artery walls sticky and collect dangerous fatty deposits. This much was found stuck to the aorta wall of a smoker, age 32. Chemicals from tobacco smoke get into your bloodstream and can damage the delicate blood vessels inside your eye. We now know that smoking is a major cause of irreversible blindness. Every cigarette is doing you damage.
So no matter who you are, take this moment to think about yourself, your future, your kids, and the rest of the family. Do not find excuses to continue smoking, but find the courage to stop. Do not find the reason to continue, but find the reason to stop. Quit today, not tomorrow. We discussed before in the previous episode uh, all of the danger about the chemical and the side effect and complication coming from smoking. And the most common things we always hear and discuss is what we call COPD or obstructive lung disease. If there's any way you can just in a simple way describe what is COPD to the patient. Well, COPD is a chronic progressive lung disease that um, affects primarily the bronchial tubes. Um, it makes um, it difficult to breathe. It's associated with excess sputum production. Um, as the disease progresses, it affects the entire body. Patients begin to lose weight. Uh, they have uh, difficulty eating. Um, and they progress to the point where they have difficulty uh, with their activities of daily life. And how many years of smoking uh, the patients needs before developing COPD? Is there any relationship, uh, relationship between the two? Well, there is. Um, it's certainly not an exact science, but in general what we say is patients need to have approximately about 10 years of smoking a pack of cigarettes per day. And, uh, but there's really no known threshold and uh, certainly there are some patients that smoke um, more than that and do not develop severe lung disease and there are patients that barely reach that threshold and they have very severe disease so there's probably genetic factors that are involved as well and what are the early signs which is the patients should watch uh, like giving him a clue maybe i'm in trouble i should go and talk to my uh, family doctor and talk to the specialist about their lung problem I mean, what are the early signs of copd well probably one of the earliest signs is cough um, you know m most folks who smoke have a, a morning cough and and they kind of ascribe it to their cigarette smoking and that is, in fact, true, but that can be one of the earliest signs. Um, shortness of breath. Um, they may notice that it's more difficult for them to climb a flight of stairs. They may have difficulty shopping. They may notice that they have to hang on the cart as they go up and down the aisles. Um, and again, the natural re response to that is, well, you know, I'm out of shape, or they ascribe it to some other problem. Um, and frequently, by the time they get to a physician, um, their disease is far advanced. There's any relationship also between secondhand smoking and COPD? There probably is. Um, the problem is it's difficult to quantify. Um, you know, we quantify uh, smoking by the number of packs of cigarettes over a period of time. With secondhand smoke, it's more difficult because it's difficult to quantitate the amount of exposure, whether it's a small room, a large room, um, the duration of, of exposure. But uh, unquestionably, we know that secondhand smoke is, is not good, especially for children. We know for sure that uh, children who grow up in households that have one or two smokers, lifelong have a decrease in their lung function they have a higher incidence of ear infections and are at greater risk to develop COPD as they get older. When we are talking about the COPD, we know that it's coming from smoking. And we know also the relationship between smoking and lung cancer. Does the patient who has COPD have high, has higher risk of cancer? Yes. In fact, if you have COPD, your risk of lung cancer is even greater than in smokers who don't have COPD. So they're additive risk factors. Okay. And uh, probably about 85% of lung cancers are associated with smoking. Now, having said that, we don't know ex the exact mechanism, what it is in cigarette smoking, what substance that causes lung cancer. And of course, this is an area of um, um, intense research. Um, but it is clear that um, that is the single big, biggest risk factor to develop lung cancer. And we always tell our patients that you should stop smoking to prevent yourself from having COPD, from having cancer, at the same time from having heart problem. And we know how difficult it is for most of the patients to quit smoking. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit with us about why it's difficult for the patient to quit smoking? 
Well, nicotine is very addictive. And especially when you start smoking before you're 21, um, there are studies that show that actually nicotine assimilates in the brain chemistry permanently. And it makes it very, very difficult to, to quit smoking. Uh, not only that, we have all kinds of cues in our culture which help people and keep reinforcing the notion of, of cigarette smoking, uh, both subtle and not so subtle um, um, clues. Uh, having said that, though, lots of folks have successfully quit smoking, and um, it's difficult. Um, when I talk to them, it's among the most difficult things that they've done. Um, but in terms of their health and well-being, it's probably the most important thing that they can do. Now, I want to go back to that point you mentioned earlier, which is related to the age of start smoking. And, you know, when our kids, you tell them you need to quit smoking, you shouldn't smoke, they tell, oh, I can't stop at any time. All of this argument is really not accurate, and I want to emphasize on that point. So smoking at younger age, it will make it much more difficult to quit smoking at right. older age. Right. There's evidence that indicates that for teenagers, after smoking only a month, it becomes difficult for them to, to quit. They're particularly susceptible to the addictive effects of, of nicotine. And you know, it's, uh, the, the problem is, you know, cigarette smoking, for, for better or for worse, has sort of become emblematic in our culture of that age-old uh, teenage struggle between rebellion and conformity, rebellion against your parents and conformity with your peers. But unfortunately, when they get over that phase, um, they're addicted. And um, uh, it, we know that the long-term quit rates for cigarette smoking are very low, only in the range of 20%. And so virtually 80% of teenagers who begin smoking will die smoking. Science and technology have had a major impact on society, and it's clear that technology has accounted for the greatest changes in medicine. Technology has improved laboratory testing, allowed for the development of CT scan, MRI exams to improve diagnostic accuracy, and produced new drugs and devices like stents, pacemakers, and defibrillators. In the past, if you needed minor surgery like gallbladder, appendectomy, or appendix surgery, or needed a major surgery like open heart surgery, you end up with a large incision and require significantly longer time to recover until the technology introduced to us the latest laparoscopic and robotic surgery, which were the major advancement in medicine during the last 10 years. Now, most surgeries can be done with a small incision, require much shorter hospital stay and faster recovery. Today, we will discuss robotic surgery's technology, why and how, provide you with enough information and knowledge about it to discuss with your doctor if you are scheduled to have a procedure. Northwest Ohio medical centers in general are exceptional. Like many advanced centers in the nation, adopting technology on a regular basis to give our patients in this area the best treatment and technology. We evolved into what's called minimally invasive surgery with laparoscopy. Essentially that means making a small incision, putting a camera in, a telescope in, using a few other small incisions and literally using what I like to call chopsticks to sort of do the surgery. So the patient benefited with smaller incisions, less pain, less blood loss, but it was very cumbersome, very difficult for the surgeon. You're sort of operating, looking away from the patient, using these long instruments three feet away, trying to do intricate procedures. So from there, we tried to figure out, well, how can we make this easier for the surgeon? And that's where robotic surgery developed. From the clinical perspective, cardiac surgeons started using robotics in about 1999. And from there, it evolved into prostate and pelvic surgery. So for about the last 13 years or so, this technology has been developing and has been refined over, over years. The Da Vinci SHD system provides a magnified view that is both three-dimensional and high definition. The result is a phenomenal immersive experience of surgery. The precisely controlled micro-movements of the Da Vinci instruments are enabled by the computer processors of the system. 
These dedicated processors perform millions of safety checks over the course of a procedure for enhanced surgical precision and control. Da Vinci Endo Wrist instruments are designed with a unique wristed architecture that provides seven degrees of freedom for a range of motion greater than even the human wrist. This proprietary design enables surgical maneuvers impossible with conventional laparoscopic tools. As the surgeon operates at the console, the Da Vinci system filters out hand tremor and translates his controlling motions to the articulating tips of the endo wrist instruments. I started having trouble breathing and I was feeling a heaviness like on my chest and my wife was pretty much noticing it more than me. She kept asking me why I was stopping when I was working in the yard and I would hold my chest. And I told her, I said, you know, I'm having this trouble breathing. I said, I don't know why, but after I sat on for a few moments, I'm okay. Well, after watching me do that for a couple of days, uh, she called the doctor and they made an appointment uh, for me to come in. Uh, it was suggested that I have a heart cath and therefore I came to Mercy to uh, have that taken care of and after Dr. Kabor did the heart cath on me, he noticed the blockage. We decided uh, to have the bypass operation. Uh, uh, the doctor uh, set it up for one week later after having the uh, catheterization. I think the most amazing part of it was was that they could do that to me and, uh, and in such a short time and the healing process took such a short time. Truly amazing. They watched over me like a mother hen uh, in my room constantly asking me how I was doing, how I was feeling, seeing to it that I had everything that I needed. You know, the next day, man, 30 hours later, they tell me I can go home. And I thought, wow, you talk about an amazing thing. 30, you know, one day, 30 hours later, they're saying, Roy, you can go home if you want. Three to four weeks, and I was back at the gym working out. And uh, I was back fishing, you know, ice fishing uh, two weeks after I had the operation. You know, so I, my life was getting back to normal. <laughs>